スキバレボンダーラマッドストーカーフォルメタル4 is a new game released for the Mega Drive or Sega Genesis in 2020. Originally, the game was released in 1994 for the PC Engine and a slew of Japanese computers, with a Mega Drive port in development. However, the Sega version would eventually be cancelled. That is, until Columbus Circle picked up the rights to the game, finished its development and eventually released it this year. The game is a mix of beat em up and fighting, all wrapped in a sci fi setting where you play as a giant mech. And I do love me some giant mechs. I have to admit, though, I had never even heard about this series. But I did find out it has a pretty dedicated cult following, many of which consider the game to be a hidden gem. I mean, the X68000 version would even be nominated for Game of the Year. Personally, though, based on the Mega Drive port, I wouldn't go that far. The game comes in a Japanese Mega Drive style box. Columbus Circle only released this game in Japan, so there are no PAL Mega Drive or Genesis versions of this release available. I have to say, the box art is absolutely stunning. I mean, yes, you could argue that it's a bit cluttered, which, yes, it is. But man, does it grab your attention! The box also fits in perfectly with the rest of your Mega Drive or Sega Genesis collection. Once again, it doesn't say Sega or Mega Drive anywhere. But it does say MD. I wonder if this was the way they found to get around the copyright issues. Or maybe copyright law works massively different in Japan than it does in the West. Either way, it is good to see a reference to the actual console this game runs on. I feel the box art is where most modern Mega Drive releases tend to drop the ball. But this game is a clear exception. I just love this art style, making it seem like a cover to a comic book or manga. Inside, we find the full color manual and the cartridge. The manual has a lot of information, which sadly I can't read. From what I can tell, it seems to include a plot synopsis, the control layout, some information on each stage, and more importantly, the special moves for each mech. More on that later. The cartridge is also in the Japanese style, which for me makes it hard to compare with other cartridges. The only official Japanese Mega Drive cart I own is Dragon Ball Z, and though the two look very similar, there are a few differences. For starters, Mad Stalker's sticker is a little closer to the bottom edge than Dragon Ball Z's, and the plastic feels rougher to the touch. You also get some different warning stickers and embossments on the back, but nothing too egregious. This is a hard one for me to compare, because I have no idea if Japanese carts were all standardized or if there were differences between each publisher. I should point out though that you'll need either a Japanese Mega Drive or an adapter to run this on your PAL Mega Drive or Sega Genesis. Otherwise, the game will not fit on your cartridge slot. Now that's all well and good, but there's one major issue. According to the Sega 16 forums, the pin connectors on these carts are too wide, meaning they could damage your console's cartridge slot after prolonged use. I did compare my game's pin connectors with that of an official Mega Drive release. And yeah, they were definitely wider than any European, American or Japanese game that I own. Now, in my case, I'll be using an adapter, so worst case scenario, I'll only end up breaking this. But, I gotta be honest, had I known that this could ruin my system, I most likely would not have bought it. So, do you take that into consideration before buying this. Overall, I am absolutely torn on this. The packaging, cartridge design and manual are absolutely wonderful. 
I honestly would have held this game as one of the gold standards of modern Mega Drive packaging, but that pin connector issue completely undoes any praise I might have for it. It looks great on a shelf, and it's a wonderful conversation piece, but do take precautions if you're going to play it. Booting up the game, you're quickly brought to a pretty long text crawl. But long story short is that in the future, they found a spaceship with advanced mechs in it. And you get to pilot one of these mechs. But then, the others go berserk and it's your job to stop them. Anyway, like I mentioned before, this game is a mix of beat-em-up like Final Fight or Streets of Rage with that of a fighting game like Street Fighter. What I mean is, you walk around on a 2D plane and you can only move left or right like you would in a fighting game and not up or down like in a beat-em-up. And there's also no one-button combo system like you would expect to find in a beat-em-up. Instead, you have two attack buttons as well as light and heavy attacks which must be chained manually to create free-form combos. You also have special moves like a dash attack, a sure you can or a gunshot which are activated by inputting special fighting game style commands. The issue is, because the manual is in Japanese, I actually did not realize that the moves were already there. Whoops. So I spent quite a bit of time initially fumbling around the controls and the game trying to figure out how to perform your special inputs. But yeah, I would end up spending quite a bit of time searching online and would even end up going to GameFAQs, which, as you might expect, the pages for the Mega Drive version were barren. So I decided to check out the boards for the TurboGrafx-16 version instead. And with that, how often do you think about your ex? What? Girl called me cute on my first date. Did I get friendzoned? My girlfriend is ignoring me. How often do you see your girlfriend? Is the co-worker trying to flirt with me? How do I get a girlfriend? What the hell did I just stumble upon? Yeah, apparently the GameFAQ forums for this 16-bit Mac game were used as the website's unofficial dating advice forums. I'm just going to stop the review now, and we're gonna go on this tangent here. Apparently, this began as far back as 2008 and lasted up until 2018. And this wasn't just a couple of dudes either. There are literally hundreds of users here, with over 1000 pages. Yes, 1000 pages of content, at 20 threads per page, totaling in 20,000 topics created seeking romantic advice. Reading this is fascinating. And I don't think there's anything that could get me to stop reading water sports. Ok, moving on. Now, learning how to change the combos requires a fair bit of experimentation. It doesn't help that your regular attacks will change depending on whether or not you're pressing the D-pad. So for example, if you press one of the attack buttons, you throw a light attack. But if you press the same attack button while holding down any direction on the D-pad, you throw a heavy attack. So you need to find the right mix of light, heavy and special attacks to perform your combos. And to be fair, when this works, it really works. Performing your very own custom combos on regular enemies is super fun and engaging. But this comes at a cost of having quite a bit of a learning curve. I'd go as far as to say I still haven't quite mastered this, but I did find myself really getting into the game. The issue is, as I mentioned previously, the learning curve. The first time I played this game, I absolutely hated it. I was treating it like a regular beat-em-up and sort of expected the game to perform automatic combos for me, which is not how this should be played. Unfortunately, for every little thing this game does right, there's something it does wrong. Fighting the enemies that are the same size as you is super engaging, and there's a nice variation of these to keep it entertaining. But then you get to the other enemies, which I've dubbed the gimmick enemies. 
I call them this because while their regular foes are entertaining, everyone else needs to be taken down with a gimmick. Smaller mechs, for example, are meant to be taken down by rushing them. Electrical balls are supposed to be taken down by jumping and performing an air throw. And these dudes are meant to be taken down with a mix of shoryukens and rushing attacks. There's just nothing interesting about them. Yes, you could try taking them out through other methods. But trust me, that will just take forever and you're bound to lose a ton of health. I wouldn't mind so much if they were a bit rarer. But the game just keeps throwing these gimmicky enemies at you incessantly. They are the first foes you'll find in level 1. And in most stages, they're more common than regular foes. It's just such an odd counterbalance to the rest of the game. On one hand, you have enemies that require actual skill and strategic thinking to defeat. And then you have these dudes who require you to spam the same move over and over. But I'd argue the worst issue of them all are the boss fights. Oh man, these are super rough. The first issue is that they appear out of nowhere and will always score a cheap hit against you unless you know what's coming. And even if you know what's coming, it's still easy for them to score a cheap hit. I mean, look at this! This boss can easily force you into an infinite hit loop if you're not careful. Technically, you're supposed to block him. But he can actually keep damaging you over and over while your character is still stuck in a damage animation. Meaning you have no way to defend yourself. Also, I gotta say, I really don't like how you're supposed to press both attack buttons to block. I'm so used to pressing the back button on fighting games to block that I often forget that blocking is even an option in this game. Then you have the fact that the enemy boss AI is super aggressive. They do not let up. I did discover that for most of them, the best way to beat them is to be cheap yourself. You can usually corner almost every boss with a heavy jump kick and then quickly throw a series of light kicks or punches while crawling to score several cheap hits. I'd feel bad about this if it were not for the fact that the enemy AI can and will be just as cheap. If you play your cards right, you can usually keep repeating this indefinitely for most boss fights. And if they manage to break free, you can often push them back into a corner and repeat this process. I really wanted to like these boss fights, but man, I just couldn't. It also does not help that during the final stage, you're thrown into a boss rush mode, where you're expected to beat them one after the other with very few health packs thrown in. Needless to say, I could not get past this part. Now, you might have already have noticed this, but graphically, this game is pretty average for the Mega Drive. Sure, you have some basic parallax scrolling, but nothing too outstanding, and most backgrounds tend to be rather plain as well, with little to no animations and a washed out color palette. I know this port is based on the Sharp X68000 version, but that version looks much better than this with better colors, animation, and I'm pretty sure it has a higher resolution. Now granted, the Sharp X68000 is a much more powerful system, so that's to be expected, I get that. But the problem is that modern Mega Drive games have so often pushed the envelope on what the system can do, that honestly, Matt Stalker kind of looks archaic by comparison. And it does not help that it's also plagued by slowdown on a near constant basis. I know all Columbus Circle did was touch up an unfinished beta and prepare it for release. But I really wish they had gone the extra mile. Like, I don't know, am I the only one who feels that your walk cycle animation looks a bit odd? Look, I know I'm not a programmer, but modern Mega Drive releases have consistently raised the bar many of which are priced lower than Matt Stalker, making this game a pretty hard sell. It also does not help 
that the PC Engine version lets you choose between three different playable mechs for the story mode. Whereas here, you're down to just one. Now granted, the PC Engine version is also missing any parallax scrolling and the backgrounds have even less animation than the Mega Drive port. But I would gladly trade all that for more playable characters in the story mode. Although, you can play as every mech and boss character in versus mode, which to be fair, is a really cool option. I definitely dig that, but I still wish I could play them in story mode. Overall, I have mixed feelings on Mad Stalker. This is a game that I really wanted to enjoy. It has a cool setting and I do love beat'em ups and mech games. I also feel that making the controls more akin to a fighting game makes it rather unique. And when it works, it really works. But then you have cheap boss fights, slowdown, gimmicky enemies, boring backgrounds, and it all just kinda falls apart from there. If you're interested, you can get this game from a few websites like PlayAsia, Japan Zone, and Columbus Circle. But be prepared to pay quite a bit for it. Good for you have Patreon, I guess. I know this game has quite a dedicated fan base. It even went on to inspire Guardian Heroes, so it definitely has its fans. And I feel that if you're into any of the previous versions, you'll get a kick out of this. But if you're going into this game completely blind, you might want to think twice before getting it. Hey everyone, thank you for watching Stickers Retro Corner. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell and share this video. All that fun social media stuff. And you can also support me on Patreon. It may not seem like it, but even one dollar is a really big help in keeping this channel going. I'd also like to thank my newest Patreon supporter, Alessandro Perlini. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Bye! Still intact.